Hi, I'm Richard Atkinson. This video will discuss the dizzyingly complex counterpoint in the opening chorus of Bach's 80th cantata, BWV 80, certainly one of his greatest contrapuntal miracles. Its title, Ein feste Burg ist unser Gott, or A Mighty Fortress is Our God, comes from the Lutheran chorale melody on which it's based, one of the most famous hymns composed by Martin Luther himself that has since become emblematic of the Protestant Reformation. Each of the separate phrases in the chorale makes an appearance in this incredibly complicated chorus, starting with the first and second phrases, which sound like this in the original chorale. The chorus opens with a more complicated version of the first phrase as the subject of a fugal passage. Now, in an astounding display of contrapuntal skill, Bach combines this subject not with just any easily composed countersubject, but with the second phrase of the original chorale. The subject and countersubject cycle through the voices while the cellos accompany with free counterpoint. This leads to another spectacular feat of counterpoint, beginning with the triumphant entrance of a much simpler variant of the first phrase in the trumpet and oboe parts. This is a very common technique Bach uses in many of his cantata choruses. He follows a fugato based on the chorale melody with an augmented cantus firmus version of the same melody. What makes this particular moment even more striking is the canonic imitation one measure later by the basses. Because of the dizzying complexity of this passage, you may not have noticed amid the canonic imitation and the elaborate free counterpoint, this additional, more surreptitious entry of the original subject. Listen again. The fugato involving these two phrases now repeats with one astonishing alteration that's difficult to notice at first. Recall that the countersubject, ignoring its pickup note, had entered one measure after the subject in the opening fugal passage. Now it is shifted temporally so that it enters two measures later, yet miraculously remains contrapuntally compatible. This leads to the same type of canonic entrance of the second chorale phrase, now as a syncopated variant. Amazingly, instead of combining this canon with just one surreptitious entry of the original subject, which last time most of us probably thought already was a remarkable feat, Bach this time combines the canon with a simultaneous three-part stretto of the original subject and ends the section with yet another temporally shifted combination of the first and second phrases now with the second phrase shifted a measure in the opposite direction.
Everything we've heard up to this point now repeats, just like the original chorale repeats, with relatively few alterations leading to a new section featuring the third phrase from the original chorale, which sounds like this. A variant of this third phrase enters the chorus as the subject of a new fugal passage. Amazingly, although at this point not surprisingly, the countersubject is the now very familiar first subject. This leads to the canonic cantus firmus-like entry of the third phrase. Thus far, I've only highlighted the contrapuntal lines derived from the original chorale melody, but it's also important to notice the ingenuity of the free counterpoint. The chromatic bass line that accompanies this fugato is one fantastic example. from the chorale is now treated in a similar fashion. First listen to the original chorale. Now listen to the new fugal subject derived from this phrase. Many people have noticed the striking similarity of this subject to another famous fugal subject from Handel's Messiah. As expected, the fugal passage based on the fourth chorale phrase leads to canonic entrances of the phrase, but this time it's a three-part canon with the third entry in the soprano part. Now the fifth phrase appears. First listen to the original chorale. Now listen to the fugato, which is accompanied by another brilliant bass line, followed by the expected canonic entries. listen to the sixth phrase as it appears in the original chorale. The fugato based on the sixth phrase is interesting because the third statement enters a measure earlier than expected, causing a mini stretto. Also momentarily at the beginning, the bass line plays an almost complete fragment of the original first subject with diminution of these four notes. I've already ignored numerous other smaller figures in what I've been calling the free counterpoint that some might argue are fragments derived from the chorale phrases. This one, however, is long enough that I think it's safe to count it. This, of course, is followed by the expected canonic entries.
The seventh phrase of the chorale is identical melodically to the second phrase, so I highlighted it with the same color. This is the only phrase that never enters as the primary subject of its own fugato, although in the remaining bars of the chorus it continues to enter in combination with the original first phrase. I've said nothing so far about the tonal structure of the movement, but it begins in D major, and the last section we just heard ended with this long F-sharp pedal tone that prepares us for the relative minor, B minor, entrance of the original first phrase to begin the last fugal passage. The four entries cycle through the circle of fifths so that the fourth entry finally returns to the original key of D major. This is followed by one final canonic entrance of the second phrase, again simultaneously combined with the intricate three-part stretto of the first phrase. The last note of the lower canonic voice becomes the final tonic pedal tone that accompanies the final statement of the second phrase combined with a near-complete fragment of the first phrase. Uh -huh. 